When you make a customer service call, what do you think determines whether you're put on hold for several minutes or speak directly to an agent? What about submitting a job application online or hearing a verdict from the judge? Is the same mechanism that determines social media feeds, search results or online ads. Despite having drastically different impact on your life, artificial intelligence is now the main decision maker in a vast array of aspects. From mundane tasks like emoji predictions, YouTube video suggestions or high-speed trading to the most life-altering decisions about you, such as health insurance, car rentals or even criminal sentencing. AI is the judge, jury, and executioner, often with the final word and no appeal process. Most of this technology is proprietary or trade secret, with no option to opt out. This is not a dystopian sci-fi scenario. This is how AI decides your life. Databases around the globe are filled with ever-growing files of your personal information. While most businesses collect your data, they don't all know what to do with it beyond inventory and sales optimization. But what all companies really want to know is how much effort they should dedicate to you individually, whether it is worth it to send you a discount voucher or they're just wasting time with you. Businesses can't do this if they don't have the ability to calculate your risk or profitability. But where there is demand, supply eventually delivers. And supply did deliver. Inspired by the loving state of Chinese oppression, ranking scores are the hottest new product of automation. You might have heard of social credit scores before. These are government rankings of citizens in China, based on their daily actions and habits. Any shopping item, public incident with the police, internet activity or social connections can raise or lower your social score. Government authorities then use these scores to assign each citizen a spectrum of freedom or restriction. How or whether they can travel, use public services, or even communicate. Luckily, Western and neoliberal democracies respect human rights, so they wouldn't divide their own citizens into different castes based on some AI derived scores. You see, under capitalism, you don't have one social score for all aspects of your life. You have a separate score for every market, designed to maximize profit and minimize risk. Some corporations hire these scoring firms to rank their own customers on a company-specific scale. But some of these AI businesses focus on combining intelligence from millions of public or private records to build ranking profiles that I then sell to enterprises around the world. Throughout my research, I've been able to identify seven different scores maintained on individuals or locations. I'd already covered some of them on this channel, and with some you might be already familiar. But there can be more and this research might just be scratching the surface. Here's what I could find. You have a consumer score, which is now widespread among customer-oriented enterprises. Then there is health score and driver score, both of which are sought by insurance companies and I already covered these two scoring systems in separate videos. Credit rating scores are nothing new, they are used in lending, loaning and banking markets. Job applicant score is most commonly deployed in resume scanning and candidate ranking. There is a risk assessment score that is used in criminal justice system and there is a predictive policing score. Most people are familiar with their credit rating scores. Credit rating have been in place for a long time, much of it is transparent to the general public. Consumer score, on the other hand, is one of those rabbit holes that you won't find unless you know where to look. Consumer scores are used in customer service and retail industries. What they essentially try to determine is customer lifetime value. Data points used to calculate these values can vary. They might rely solely on spending habits. Others include hundreds of inputs including zip codes and location data, housing value, website interactions, social media data, purchasing records, the number of returns, and much more. Retailers track whether you only shop for deeply discounted products or you don't care about the price 
prized that much. Some retailers think your single status makes you a more valuable customer than a couple. Others think the opposite. Each data point from your day-to-day -day life can increase or decrease your consumer score. If you're expected to cost the company more than you spend, you can even get a negative score. Retailers might put you at the end of the line during a customer service call or eject your returns if your score is too low. If it's too high, on the other hand, you might be their priority. But if your spending is large, they might save their discounts for someone else and let you pay higher prices unless they think they could lose you. This practice isn't commonplace just in retail though. Car rentals might reward high score customers with easier access to loaner cars, preferential service slots, or special events. A low consumer ranking can get you a worse seat at an airliner. If you complain too much, you might be costing too much time and money Money to be valued. There is a reason why consumer scores have grown in use so rapidly in the recent years. Companies do have a point. Not every customer deserves the same treatment. And maybe some people really are assholes that are not worth the time. But consumer scores take into account factors you have no immediate control over, such as your age, gender, or the value of your neighborhood. Not to mention the level of data collections such consumer ranking algorithms require. But privacy invasion is, as weird as it's gonna sound, just a side effect. None of these companies are actually interested in what you do. In most cases, people are not even looking at the data. Your private information is usually just fed directly to the machines, which spit out your score and move on. The biggest worry is that these companies and their algorithms are making judgments about you. They're making decisions that can make your life really miserable or truly awesome. They're interpreting your behavior oftentimes out of context, but always without your say. If you're like me, you've been struggling to find a real job, so you decided to start a YouTube channel. But when I used to apply for jobs, nobody told me I needed to prepare for artificial intelligence. Before you even have a chance to talk to a human being at an employer's HR department, proprietary algorithms are secretly scanning your job application and run checks on your profile. In 2019, 67% of LinkedIn recruiters said they were using these algorithms to screen for the best candidate in the widest pool of applicants possible. Hiring software relies on a variety of data collected from internal databases, public job boards, social media platforms, and open source intelligence. If you ever submitted a video as part of your job application process, that company might have used facial recognition software to grade your verbal responses and facial movements. Some algorithms are making predictions about a candidate's likelihood of leaving the job for a new one based on their past promotions or job movement. One company is selling an app that invites candidates to play a neuroscience computer game to predict cognitive and personality traits. So that game was actually looking at your levels of impulsivity, it was looking at your attention span, and it was looking at how you learn from mistakes. One piece of software went viral on social media for allowing parents to vet potential babysitters by assigning them scores based on the lifetime of social media images and posts. The popular belief is that these algorithms select the best candidates neutrally. After all, there are many biases hiring managers exhibit. To a surprisingly large extent, that's true. Favoritism, attraction, or cultural preferences might skew the efforts of choosing the most appropriate candidate for the job. Machines do not develop feelings for people. Alexa, do you love me? That's not the kind of thing I am capable of. And as cold as they are, they should be the most objective selectors. But the machines can only do what they were taught. They learn from datasets fed to them by their developers. And that data can only come from the real world, not an ideal world. That means past hiring practices are necessarily going to be embedded in the training data. And machine learning algorithms are going to replicate hiring habits of the past. There is no other story that illustrates this problem more vividly than Amazon's hiring AI. To make recruitment easier and more effective, the retail giant developed an AI to sift through resumes of thousands of candidates and rank them from 1 to 5 stars. The algorithm was trained by observing patterns in resumes submitted to Amazon over a 10-year period. The algorithm eventually taught itself to downgrade female candidates to the point it selected for resumes mentioning the words women's as a marker for bad ranking. 
When Amazon realized this, they tried to tweak the tool. They understood that over the past 10 years, the company has allowed mail resumes to dominate the selection process. But even then, the algorithm kept repeating the same pattern. Prefer males, downgrade females. Amazon eventually lost hope and disbanded the entire team working on the AI alongside the algorithm itself. Bias, as it turns out, is an inherent characteristic of machine learning algorithms. There's no such thing as a neutral AI. Their developers aren't objective and their training data isn't neutral. Algorithms think about the problems they're solving differently than humans. They do eliminate certain human errors that biological intelligence often falls victim to. Machines don't have short attention spans, attention deficits, or hunger problems, but what they're best at is also their biggest weakness. When they're given bad input, they reproduce really bad outcomes. This doesn't say that AI or their developers are xenophobic. AI companies would deny any form of hard-coded bias or discrimination, and it is unreasonable to assume they would do so on purpose. What's more likely is that they don't see how biases in training data affect those that are discriminated against. What we know this means for sure is the machines won't solve our racism. Speaking of racism, let's talk about the criminal justice system and policing. Lawyers, judges, police and prosecutors are increasingly relying on automation to aid their jobs. This makes sense when sifting through large amounts of paperwork quickly and efficiently, which clears up space to do human work where it is most necessary. Judges, however, do rely on artificial intelligence in trials and pre-trials hearings to determine how likely defendants are to re-offend if let go. But the AI relies on a very questionable set of data. It feeds on data from the real world. Any systemic bias or injustice embedded in police history serves as a training ground for the AI. 60% of the US jail population have been arrested without conviction. According to the US Department of Justice, blacks are twice as likely to be arrested than whites and five times as likely to be stopped without a just cause. And the results of algorithmic risk assessment are in line with the real-world practice. According to a ProPublica analysis, the algorithm used in many US states have labeled 23% of white people high risk, yet they didn't reoffend. but with the black people, the rate was near 45%. Of those labeled lower risk that did reoffend, up to 48% of them were white, but only 28% of them were black. The analysis further shows that blacks were 77% more likely to be labeled high risk of committing a future violent crime and 45% more likely to be predicted to commit a future crime of any kind. The algorithm in question uses a set of 137 questions to calculate the risk, but none of them is about race. Many of the questions, though, frame socioeconomic factors that disproportionately involve poor populations and black minorities. There is very little research on this or other algorithms. Whether AI re-embraces systemic biases in criminal justice seems likely, but not conclusive. These risk scores are looking at many of these socioeconomic factors out of context and apply them statistically to individual defendants. Judges rely on them to determine whether to let a person go without a cash bail or put them in jail. Some defendants have appealed against such use of automation, arguing that it violates the requirement that a sentence should be individualized. Risk assessment scores, as the theme goes, are calculated by proprietary algorithms. They are developed by private businesses with for-profit motive. Their methodology is not peer-reviewed or open source. Researchers rarely, if ever, get a short glimpse at how they might work. Specific calculations are trade secret, and companies refuse to give more transparency under the pretense of protecting their business interests. This doesn't imply that judges and juries are without their own biases. Numerous studies have pointed to countless of factors that unfairly impact sentencing. When election season comes around, circuit courts tend to disagree more and vote along partisan lines. Judges tend to be more lenient on defendants' birthdays, and parole boards make harsher decisions before lunch and at the end of day. We can openly study, question and appeal all of these factors. We can see how judges make decisions and we can criticize them for it. 
we can do this with proprietary AI. If there is conclusive evidence for or against automation in criminal court, it is unlikely to be discovered in secrecy. Making predictions about people, though, doesn't start before the judge. It begins with the police. In an attempt to stop the crime before it even happens, police now turn to AI for help. Predictive policing is a tool of automation that seeks to identify hotspots and potential victims or perpetrators of crimes so that police units can be distributed where they're most needed. Predictive policing takes one of the two most common forms. Location-based algorithms predict where and when crimes are most likely to occur based on links between places, events, and crime rates. They identify hotspots of high likelihood of criminal activity. Person-based algorithms learn from data pools on age, gender, marital status, arrest rates, criminal record, and substance abuse history. They predict who is the most likely to commit or be a victim in a future crime. As is the theme with predictive AI, the same data that can skew risk assessment scores in court can influence predictive policing tools. Arrest rates or drug abuse records are disproportionately affecting minorities of color, even if they are poor indicators of future criminal activity. But in addition to that, identifying certain places as hotspots or some people as more statistically likely to be involved in crime can prime police officers to do more stops or arrests because of prejudice instead of necessity. Like with risk scores, predictive policing tools are also developed privately and very little is known about how decisions are being calculated. Not only are these AI tools proprietary, but their implementation is often hidden from the public. In the most extreme case of Palantir in New Orleans, no one in the municipality Neither the residents or the city council knew that a company's crime forecasting software was employed by the local police department. Palantir's algorithm was trained on millions of public and private records, including court filings, licenses, phone numbers, and social media data. Similar obfuscation took place in LAPD and NYPD. Security concerns are cited as a reason for keeping the public in the dark about these projects. But too much secrecy removes accountability when policing goes too far. Crime forecasting has little to no oversight, yet it has the most detrimental impact on people and the society. Businesses, courts, and the police have adopted artificial intelligence to assign scores to individuals based on poorly understood statistical analysis. The public needs to start a dialogue about whether or not we want to accept the ethics of this practice. You can start local initiatives to demand transparency and public access to the development, adoption and calculations of these scores. Ideally, the development of predictive AI tools should be open source and plenty of peer-reviewed research should be funded to determine the quality and necessity of each of these decision-making algorithms. That will take some time. Until then, there are measures to take to protect yourself from automated ranking of your behavior. Since algorithms rely on data, perhaps the best you can do right now is to limit the amount of data you feed them. If your social media data, purchasing habits, or search records can influence your score, let those data points go dark. Protect your social graph by diverting most if not all of your communication to the most secure and private messengers available. The most anonymous messenger is Briar, but Signal or Matrix would serve you well if you just want privacy with all the mainstream features. Your search record and browser history are sensitive information. They reveal a lot about things you wouldn't even share with others. The best way to protect both of these data points is with the Tor browser. Your browser history will no longer be traceable with search and web surfing hidden by the anonymous Tor network. Try to pay cash instead of buy card in physical stores if you can do so safely. Retailers and payment processors often share your purchases with data brokers and advertisers for further monetization. Don't give them your identity. Privacy is a moving target, so there is always more that can be done, but you don't have to be paranoid. Do what makes sense to you and educate yourself about how you can protect yourself better. My playlists on anonymity, privacy, and security provide a wealth of information to begin with. 
a lot of important information didn't make it into this video. That's why I dedicated several podcast episodes on my Patreon page to go more in depth on how artificial intelligence decides your life. The struggle of this channel is rising. YouTube has significantly slashed my earnings and audience reach. Please consider your support on Patreon and by engaging in likes and comments. Your support is essential. Thank you. Thank you.